Hello, this is Gina Piscatelli with uh, the first respiratory system lecture for Anatomy and Physiology 2 at Madison Area Technical College. I've broken down this lecture into four basic um, subtopics. The first is um, just looking at what the major organs are of the respiratory system. The second is um, listing the functions of the respiratory system just an overview, not a lot of detail. And then in the third, we'll look at um, how the organs are subdivided into different regions, anatomically and functionally. So kind of a categorization. And then in the fourth, we're gonna go through every part of the respiratory system, look at uh, gross anatomy in some detail, the tissue, that's present in the organs and the functions of the various organs. So without further delay, let's start with the first category here or subtopic, and that is the major organs of the respiratory system. They include from superior to inferior, the nasal cavity, and connected to the nasal cavity, the paranasal sinuses, the pharynx, the larynx, which leads to the trachea, and the trachea subdivides into two main airways, each called a bronchus. Together they are called bronchi. So we have the right primary bronchus and the left primary bronchus. You can also call them main bronchi, but I chose primary. And then of course we have the lungs, the right lung and the left lung, which is surrounded by a membrane that we call the pleura. Not really considered part of the respiratory system is the diaphragm. However, we need the diaphragm in order to breathe. So it's a little bit surprising. It's a muscle and it expands the thoracic cage or cavity. So we'll look at that function a little bit later. Okay, our second subtopic here is uh, what are the functions of the respiratory system? Well, of course, the main function is to obtain oxygen for all the body's cells and tissues, but also to expel a waste product called carbon dioxide. So as cells use oxygen and organic nutrients, they produce this waste product, CO2, uh, in a gas, it's a gas, and um, the lungs, when they are ventilated, will um, release CO2 into the atmosphere. So we refer to this ventilation of the lungs, that's the exchange of air with the atmosphere, as external respiration. And we'll talk more about why we call it external versus internal in a little bit. The respiratory system, of course, transports the gases in the air, and we will see that there is some internal respiration that takes place um, between the cells and the blood, and then between the blood and the air in the lungs. So we'll come back to that. So really our main function is obtain oxygen and expel CO2. Now there are some other functions as well, and we'll come back to that, but that's the main one. So let's look at what respiration really means. Respiration is any process involved in supplying the body with oxygen and eliminating CO2. So in the respiratory system, this involves ventilation of the lungs. So ventilation is the movement of air in and out of the lungs. There's two parts to ventilation, inspiration and expiration. 
Inspiration is when air moves into the lungs, and expiration is when air moves out of the lungs. Now, this type of respiration um, also involves in our body the exchange of gases between the lungs and blood. So the lungs bring in O2, but that has to be transferred to the bloodstream to be um, sent to all parts of the body. And of course, when tissues produce CO2, they need to put that, well, CO2 needs to go into the blood and the blood travels to the lungs and then the gas has to be released from the lungs into the environment. We really refer to this as gas exchange between the cells and blood, and that would be internal respiration versus external respiration. Those two aren't nearly as important as contrasting what the respiratory system does in terms of respiration uh, with cellular respiration. Because in A&P1, we learned about cellular respiration, where cells com consume oxygen and produce CO2. That, that's a different process. Of course, it does involve oxygen and carbon dioxide, but um, it's not about exchanging with the blood or with the air. Some other functions of the respiratory system include speech or making noises, vocalizations. That involves the vocal cords, which are found in the larynx. And smell, um, when we inhale, any kind of odors or aromas are detected in the nasal cavity by the olfactory epithelium. Another important part of the respiratory system is the balance of pH in our body fluids and tissues. Um, the way the respiratory system contributes to this is by controlling how much CO2 is in the body, uh, particularly in the blood. So CO2 um, makes the blood acidic. And by getting rid of CO2, the blood will become more basic. So that's how the respiratory system is involved. Now, you might recall when we did the circulatory system in the last unit, we talked a lot about blood pressure regulation. And the lungs were involved with the production of angiotensin, which was a strong vasoconstrictor and... Um, also increases blood volume indirectly, and so it raises blood pressure. So the lungs do contribute to blood pressure. The other functions of the respiratory system involve expanding the thoracic cavity or um, the abdominal cavity in order to aid the flow of fluids in the lymphatic vessels and of course, blood in the venous system. We refer to this as the thoracic pump, and we'll look at that a little bit later. Another thing, and tightly related to that, is um, that the respiratory system does, is it aids in expulsion of abdominal and pelvic contents. You probably know this because you're human, and um, you've probably held your breath and grunted to lift something up. Um, this is known as the Valsalva maneuver. And so when we inhale, there is um, the capability of that helping to expel abdominal and pelvic contents. So I'm going to talk to you about the Valsalva maneuver first. That, that introduces some anatomy and it ties in the um, inspiration and expiration parts of the respiratory system function. So this maneuver was named by somebody named Valsalva and um, it was originally described as a method for 
clearing your your middle ear inflating the eustachian tube if it became blocked and we routinely use this to expel abdominal and pelvic contents but what happens is that we try to force expiration or exhalation against a closed airway let me show you how this works so air comes into the nasal cavity goes through the pharynx and now it it's trying to enter the glottis the glottis is the opening to the larynx so air comes into the larynx down the bronchi and fills the lungs in order for this to happen the thorax has to expand which we haven't talked about yet so the first thing that happens with the valsalva maneuver is that we inhale to do that we contract the diaphragm downwards and the thoracic cage or cavity expands our um, it the volume increases and so that makes air flow in but now if you close this glottis so that air cannot move either way out in or out of the respiratory system and then finally contract your abdominal muscles that will um, put more pressure on the abdominal um, cavity as did the diaphragm the diaphragm also pressed down so when thora the thoracic cavity expands during inhalation and the abdominal muscles are contracted that's like a double pressure on the abdominal pelvic organs and it um, helps to expel any contents um, in those organs in that region so that's the Valsalva maneuver okay we will talk about these other functions as we proceed from superior to inferior in our study of the organs and tissues of the respiratory system I'm going to move on to the third subtopic now which is um, the functional subdivisions so there are functional subdivisions of respiratory organs and there are anatomical subdivisions so we looked already at the organs I'll just repeat them we've got the nasal cavity we have the pharynx we have the larynx which is right here then the trachea and then the two bronchi and there's more airways that go into the lungs so the two subdivisions that are considered functional are the conducting zone and the respiratory zone the conducting zone is uh, includes all organs or structures that conduct air that's all that that's all that they do supposedly right obviously the nasal cavity there's smell and in the larynx there's um, vocalizations but the main function is to conduct air towards and away from the lungs the respiratory zone is functionally considered the site where gas exchange takes place so this will be in um, only in the lungs between structures in the lungs called alveoli and the blood so there's two functional subdivisions let's look at the anatomical subdivisions I think these will be more familiar to you because you've probably heard of things like upper respiratory tract infections and lower respiratory tract infections let's see what they're talking about when they say that this involves the anatomical subdivisions and we consider the upper respiratory tract to include the nasal cavity and the sinuses the pharynx and the larynx that's it the lower respiratory tract includes the trachea and any structures in the lung including the pleura Now I will say that there are some um, different ways to divide upper and lower respiratory tract and where it differs is with the larynx 
So sometimes the larynx is considered part of the upper and sometimes not. It's considered part of the lower. It depends on what um, textbook you're looking at, really. I chose to make it part of the upper respiratory tract because it kind of made sense to me that the cutoff would be, you know, right before the trachea. Okay, now we're going to go through all the organs of the um, respiratory system. And starting with the conducting zone, we're going to look at the organs anatomy, their histology, and their functions. So this is a regional approach. We'll start with the nasal cavity. The nasal cavity, as you know from studying the skull, is divided into two regions or spaces called fossa. And they're formed by the fact that there is um, a septum in the nasal cavity. And you know that's composed of two bones now. We won't, we won't talk about that too much. Um, and then in the lateral wall of the nasal fossa are turbinates. And these turbinates are part of the ethmoid bone. Um, what they do is enhance air turbulence. And as you breathe in or exhale, the air whirls around and that, that optimizes filtering, cleansing the air, heating or warming it, and moistening the air. So the nasal um, turbinates are quite important. If we look at um, this picture of the gross anatomy shown in a cadaver, you can see the superior turbinate up here, and then the middle turbinate is right here, and the inferior is its own bone. It's down here. And the nasal cavity also has this little pocket in the front or pouch in the front. That's called a vestibule. And in the vestibule are hairs called vibrissae. And the vibrissae help to filter the air, of course, as well by trapping particles. So the functions of the nasal cavity include cleansing the air, warming the air, and humidifying the air, but of course, also smell. So let's look at how these things are accomplished. The vibrissae can filter, so that's the cleansing part. There's something called olfactory epithelium lining part of the nasal cavity, the superior part of the nasal cavity, where there are receptors for smell. These are specific cells that detect orders, odors, not orders, odors, and a signal is sent to your brain once the odor binds to the receptor. The rest of the nasal cavity is lined with pseudostratified, ciliated, columnar epithelium. And you might remember that that consists of goblet cells. And those goblet cells create or make mucus. And so that moistens the epithelium, which in turn humidifies the air and warms the air because there's, um, there's excellent blood supply beneath the connective tissue um, beneath this epithelium. So it, it helps to warm the air as well. I'd like to show you kind of the location of the olfactory epithelium in the nasal cavity. As I mentioned, it is superiorly located. And how it differs, of course, is that um, there aren't so many goblet cells. Um, there aren't so many cilia. And instead, what you find in the epithelium are these specialized cells that we call receptors that bind to the odors as they pass by. So when an odor binds to this receptor, the receptor um, is triggered to produce an action potential and an impulse is created that goes to your brain. So that's the olfactory epithelium.
just to remind you that of what respiratory epithelium looks like. This is the, um, a good picture of respiratory epithelium. It consists of uh, this bottom basal lamina layer and columnar cells that, you know, you would think are layered, but it's not really layered. That's why we call it pseudostratified. And then there's cilia present. And these cilia trap particles. Now, underneath the epithelium, there are also mucous glands and blood vessels. So these are mucous glands here, and this is probably a vein right here. So the vein ha contains blood, which retains heat, and that heat will travel or radiate to a cooler region when you breathe in cool air. So it'll radiate towards the nasal cavity. And the mucus is released into the nasal cavity as well. There's something really cool about the um, connective tissue underneath the respiratory epithelium that I want to tell you about. It has to do with the fact that there are veins um, lying beneath the epithelium. I guess I'll show that to you real close again here. This network of um, blood vessels, veins in particular, that are in what we call the submucosa layer. So this is the submucosa <clears throat> of the epithelial, I'm sorry, not of the epithelial tissue, of the tissue lining the nasal cavity. Anyway, the presence of these um, veins in the inferior turbinate especially um, are called swell bodies because they can dilate and constrict. Now, why do we care about dilation and constriction of veins in the nasal cavity of all places? Well, because if you dilate the veins, then um, the tissue swells and it blocks airflow minimally, but it blocks it, it reduces airflow for a short time and that prevents the epithelium from drying out. So swell bodies on the right and then cell bodies on the left alternate their dilation, dilation and constriction so that um, each nasal cavity or each nasal fossa gets a chance to re-moisturize, so to speak. Okay, let's look at the paranasal sinuses now. You've studied these already when you studied the skeletal system. These sinuses um, function to decrease the weight of the skull. They're, they're spaces inside of a bone. And they're located in the frontal bone, left and right. The sphenoid bone, left and right, it's kind of hard to see that here, and the ethmoid, which is also hard to see, as well as the maxillary bone. So there's four different bones where you'll find these spaces that contain air. Now they are connected to the nasal cavity. So the air that comes in the nasal cavity can enter these spaces. And of course, air can leave, not as easily, but it can leave the sinuses. These sinuses are lined with respiratory epithelium, so it's all about moisturizing and warming the air. Not as much about cleansing. There's no cilia. I mean, there is some cilia in there, but they don't do as much with that. Okay, we'll move on inferiorly and look at the pharynx now. So the nasal cavity ends where this picture shows green and the pharynx begins, it's a funny word, I realize, which is just a muscular funnel and it's made up of smooth muscle. There's the nasopharynx, which is closest to the nasal cavity. That's a region of the pharynx. And the tube continues inferiorly 
to this pink region, which is the oropharynx, and that's because it's connected to the oral cavity. And beneath that, we call the pharynx the laryngopharynx because it is adjacent to the larynx, which is shown anteriorly. I just circled it. So it's a muscular funnel, and um, it allows the passage of air through the nasal cavity into the larynx to re reach the trachea, or even substances that enter the oral cavity can enter the pharynx. If it's air, we want it to take the same pathway. But what if it's food? If it's food, then we don't want it to go in the larynx and it'll continue down this blue region of the, I mean, we don't want it to go in the larynx. I'm sorry, we don't want food to go in the larynx. So the food will continue down the inferior portion of the pharynx to reach the esophagus. So the pharynx has um, both air and food moving through it as well as liquid when you drink or swallow. So. Um, the respiratory epithelium that we find in the nasal cavity extends down um, approximately to the oropharynx. And from there, the epithelium transitions to stratified squamous epithelium because the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx will experience friction when we swallow food. So the overall function of this pharynx is to direct food and air to the proper location or passageway. Food needs to go into the esophagus. Air needs to go into the larynx. This is a good slide to show you the opening to the larynx as well. Um, it's located where the laryngopharynx is. So this is the opening to the larynx that I've just circled right there. Okay, now we're gonna move on to the larynx. The larynx looks like a tube as well, especially on that um, sagittal section picture we just looked at, but it has complicated structure involving cartilages that keep it patent or open. So um, at the very top of the larynx is a bone called the hyoid bone. And attached to the hyoid bone is connective tissue that um, connects the hyoid bone to the first large cartilage of the larynx called the thyroid cartilage. This thyroid cartilage has a prominence um, anteriorly that we sometimes refer to as um, the Adam's apple. Then beneath the thyroid cartilage is a smaller cartil cartilage, at least in the front, called the cricoid cartilage. And there's connective tissue between there as well, between the thyroid and the cricoid cartilage. But notice if you look from the posterior side instead, you'll see that the cricoid cartilage kind of is bigger. It's quite big there. So that is where the larynx ends, is at the cricoid cartilage. From here down is the trachea. So we'll cover that next. But first, let's look at the tissue found in the larynx. So we already know that there's cartilages involved. There's also this big cartilage that's part of the larynx that I neglected to mention. It's called the epiglottis. And the epiglottis is almost like a door. When something presses against it, it can push downward. And so it comes down and that closes this opening that I've circled referred to as the glottis. So in this picture, the round circle is the glottis, the opening to the larynx.
So the cartilages form the framework, but the interior is lined with epithelium. And the epithelium is respiratory epithelium. So that means pseudostratified, ciliated, columnar epithelium. Also present in the larynx, just past the glottis, are folds called vestibular folds on the right and left side. This is showing the left side. And then beneath that is a vocal cord. So this vestibular fold, combined with its partner on the right, can um, also close off the larynx. But the vocal cord, of course, um, is what produces sound. It vibrates when air passes through. And I'll show you some a, a better picture that describes that. So the functions of the larynx are to maintain an open airway so that air can be conducted all the way down to the respiratory zone eventually. The larynx is also important in voice production and swallowing, particularly the epiglottis, which will close, and the vestibular folds. Both of those will help in swallowing food because it will close off the airway. So let's look at um, a picture from the top of the larynx, a superior view through the opening of the larynx. So the epiglottis would be up here. And um, if you swallowed, it would, it would fold downwards and close this opening that you see labeled here as the glottis. But in addition, the vestibular folds, which are here and here, can come together, because there's smooth muscle under there, to close off the glottis even more tightly. And that will prevent aspirating liquids and food. And then the vocal cords are deeper. And the vocal cords can be seen as um, kind of tight strips. Um, they're made up of connective tissue. And there's a cartilage called an arytenoid cartilage that helps these vocal cords swivel inward or outward, which would make the air resonate um, at different pitches as it passes through the glottis. And so that's what creates noise. Okay, let's look at the next structure, and that will be the trachea. So the trachea is another organ in the conducting zone, or I guess we'll call it the lower respiratory tract for now. The function of the trachea is primarily to conduct air to the two main bronchi, which will branch off of the trachea, one to each lung. But it has a lining that cleanses, filters, and humidifies air, just like the entire conducting zone. Um, and because of the presence of cartilage, much like the larynx, it prevents airway collapse, which is most important during exhalation, actually, not um, inhalation or expiration. The gross anatomy of the trachea um, consists of rings of cartilage. They're, they're called C-shaped cartilaginous rings. They're not perfect C's, but I mean, it's like the letter C. They're open on the back, meaning they don't connect on the back. Instead, there is smooth muscle located there. So in this picture on your left, on the screen's left, you can see that there are cartilaginous rings all down the trachea. The very last cartilage kind of has a V shape to it. Um, and that's called the carina. That's the last cartilage before bifurcation to the two main bronchi occurs.
So if these are C-shaped cartilaginous rings, let's look at the cross section in more detail. So if we were to cut the top off and then peer down from a superior view, we would see the cartilage anteriorly and then the tracheallus muscle, which is smooth muscle, connects the two ends of the C-shaped car cartilage on the back side. This is an important feature of the trachea because the esophagus lies directly behind it. And when we swallow food down the esophagus, it expands. And it even expands anteriorly towards the trachea. And so this soft tissue allows the um, esophagus to bulge temporarily at specific locations. But in addition, the tracheallus muscle, which can contract, can um, narrow the trachea's diameter or widen it when it relaxes. So that's also really important for controlling the airway diameter. So we'll look at the histology at a little, in a little bit more detail. The layers of the tissue that make up the wall of the trachea from innermost lining to outermost include the mucosa, the submucosa, and then there's this hyaline cartilage, and then the outer layer is called the adventitia. So the mucosa is respiratory epithelium just like before, with cilia and goblet cells, pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. So you can imagine the air is moistened and warmed um, and, so, and cleansed because of the cilia. Underneath the mucosa or the epithelium, we see connective tissue and many more mucous glands which will actually help with both humidifying and filtering, which I'll explain in just a second. But here's some mucus glands. They kind of look like um, rings of simple cuboidal epithelium. And then this is hyaline cartilage. And then there's just connective tissue on the outside, dense fibrous connective tissue, outermost or most superficial. I wanted to show you a really cool picture of pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. I think this is really nifty. So this is the basal lamina. You can see the cilia. This is from a scanning electron microscope. And there's some debris on top of the cilia here. And this pink cell, that is a goblet cell. I think that's really cool. I can't take credit. Somebody else took it, of course. Okay, what's cool about the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium of the trachea is that it act, acts, A-C-T-S, as an escalator, meaning it's going to move substances superiorly um, in the airway. So the mucus that is um, very superficial in the airway traps particles and then the cilia move and the cilia propel both the mucus and the particles superiorly. So we call this the muco for mucus, ciliary for the cilia escalator. Pretty technical term for clearing your throat, right? Okay, beyond the trachea, more inferiorly are the two main bronchi, but as you can see in this picture, the airway um, really diverges quite a bit. So you get further air passages or conducting zones, um, mainly consisting of cartilage, but we will talk about that in more detail. Before we examine this branching pattern of the different levels of bronchi, I think we should look at the lungs. So I'm going to show you the lung anatomy. Um, 
the gross anatomy of the lungs. So, of course, there's two lungs. And the lung on the right is composed of three lobes. And there is visceral pleura that dips in between these lobes. So they, they really, really are anatomically separated from one another. So the top one is the superior lobe. The middle one is the middle lobe. The one on the bottom is the inferior lobe. But the lung on the left only contains two lobes. The superior lobe, which is quite large in the front anyway, and the inferior lobe. This is in part due to the presence of the heart on the left side. So the heart usually sits at an angle right here. And so the region of the lung that's adjacent to the heart is called the cardiac impression, sometimes the cardiac notch. And if we look at the airways, you see the trachea coming down and bifurcating into two main or primary bronchi. But then notice that there's further branching to each lobe. So some airway goes into the superior lobe and then the main bronchus continues. And then a small area goes into the middle lobe, but the main bronchus continues until we get to um, a smaller branch that goes into the inferior lobe. And the same thing happens on the left. It's just that there's only two branches for the two lobes. And the area where the main or primary bronchus first enters the lung tissue is called the hilum. And I think this is kind of a relevant region to discuss because um, that is often where um, not toxins, but debris can, can accumulate um, right in that location. So this is looking at um, a left lung, the medial view. And so the trachea would come down and the left bronchus is right here. Left primary bronchus is right there. And this is the front of the lung and this is the back side of the lung. And I wanted to show you this hilum region because there's a lot of different structures right there. There's um, obviously the main bronchus, but there this is also where the arteries and veins come to the lungs and leave the lungs, carrying blood to and from the, the lung. Okay, so now let's name the bronchi. That's really where we're at. The gross anatomy of the bronchial tree, we sometimes call it. <clears throat> the primary bronchus I've mentioned, one left, one right. A secondary bronchus is an airway that is traveling to a lobe. So a secondary bronchus would be here and there to the superior lobes. And um, then there's a middle bronchus on the right side and uh, a ter uh, sorry, and a um, inferior bronchus on the right side. When these secondary bronchi diverge then and the, they become more narrow, then we call them tertiary bronchi. So this secondary bronchus that's coming down to the inferior lobe, it's going to branch into tertiary bronchi. One for each segment of the lung in one lobe. So lobes are composed of multiple segments, approximately 10 segments on the left side. I'm sorry, I think that's backwards on the right side and eight on the left. And we're going to talk about that in lab too.
This picture um, starts to explain the different types of tissue that we find in the airways or the bronchi. The cartilaginous plates that we saw, or rings that we saw in the trachea, change but continue. So we'll still have cartilage in the main or primary bronchus and the secondary, and to some extent in the tertiary, but not quite as much. But instead of being full rings, completely encircling the airway, they become plates. So they're arranged a little bit more haphazardly. And in between the plates, you see the colored regions that look kind of red. That's smooth muscle. So the smooth muscle can constrict just like um, the trachealis in the trachea. So as we get down um, to the tertiary bronchi, or you could call them segmental bronchi, there's further diversion and they become super small, the airways, and we call them bronchioles. And there's two different types of bronchioles that I will introduce to you. Um, one is called a respiratory bronchiole, and the other is called a terminal bronchiole. So if you have the um, tertiary bronchus coming in from your left, I'm trying to wait for the picture to come. Okay, here it is. Air comes in. So that's the, the bronchus, the or yeah, the tertiary bronchus, the divergence into a bronchiole happens, and right away we call that a terminal bronchiole. We only call it a respiratory bronchiole if there are these little sac-like structures adhered to it. These um, are called alveoli. And alveoli are thin epithelial tissue across which gas can move. So that's why we can call this part of the bronchiole a respiratory bronchiole because gas can move across these alveoli. So the terminal bronchi, or bronchiole, sorry, the terminal bronchioles lead to respiratory bronchioles which lead to a duct. And the duct is called an alveolar duct. And you'll notice that by the time you get to the duct, there's no smooth muscle anymore. Um, it's just um, epithelial tissue. And the alveoli are bunched together, and we call that an alveolar sac. So if we look at the histology of um, all these passageways from primary to secondary to tertiary bronchi and then to the terminal bronchioles, what we see is superficially there's elastic fibers. So that provides stretch and recoil, stretch and recoil. And then deep to that are cartilages Hyaline cartilage is what they're made up of. And in the primary bronchi, they turn into cartilaginous plates versus a complete ring. But by the time we get down to the bronchioles, there's no more cartilage. Instead, what we have is the elastic fiber still there, and we have smooth muscle. And then lining the interior is epithelium always lining an interior of an organ is epithelium. And the type of epithelium changes as we go distally. So the primary and secondary bronchi, like the trachea, still um, are lined with respiratory epithelium, with goblet cells. But that changes. And eventually when you get down to the bronchioles, they're no longer columnar cells, they're cuboidal and simple without goblet cells. And there's this transitional period where the cells are, are columnar, um, but you won't see cilia. So there's quite the change in histology.
becomes more simplified. And I think this picture shows it pretty well. It shows that the main bronchus, which is right here in this region, contains all the different tissues that we've talked about. Elastic fibers, smooth muscle, hyaline cartilage, and pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium, which of course contains goblet cells and cilia, but there's also mucous glands in the submucosa. Then we get to the secondary um, and tertiary bronchi, and what you see diminishing are goblet cells. They go down in number. The glands, not as many located. Hyaline cartilage is disappearing with time, but the smooth muscle is still present and the elastic fibers are still present. Then when we get down to the bronchioles, you won't see cartilage anymore. So in both a terminal bronchiole and a respiratory bronchiole, it doesn't matter, these bronchioles, you don't have cartilage anymore. No cartilage. It's all gone. By the time you get to the alveoli, all you have are epithelial cells with elastic fibers surrounding the outside. So um, right there, simple squamous epithelium, which we haven't talked about yet, but there are elastic fibers there. So this is a picture cross-section of a main bronchus or primary bronchus, and it shows you the epithelial lining, and it shows you this hyaline cartilage plate. See, it doesn't go all the way around. It's not completely seat-shaped. And it's interspersed with smooth muscle. So there's some smooth muscle there, and then there's more cartilage, and then there's smooth muscle going around 360 degrees. So the cartilaginous changes, I think, are easy to see in this picture. Um, the plates kind of look like globs, like stones almost, a stonework, and they disappear distally. So the, the bronchioles don't have any cartilage. And I wanted to show you that by the time you get down to bronchioles, what you have um, are smooth muscle fibers surrounded by elastic fibers. But of course, the interior is composed of epithelium tissue in from bronchial all the way down to alveoli. And down in the alveolar sac, you have epithelial tissue surrounded by elastic fibers. That's it. Well, that completes what we need for the conducting zone. Now we can look at uh, the gross anatomy, histology, and functions of just the respiratory zone. So now we're just going to be in the lungs, nowhere else. We've covered a lot of ground so far. So the respiratory zone in includes anywhere where gas exchange can take place. We consider this mainly to be in the alveoli. Now it is true, as I mentioned previously, that there are some alveoli stuck on these bronchioles by themselves and gas exchange can take place there. But I don't think we need to split hairs about that. We'll just consider the alveoli being the main structure of, resp of the respiratory zone. And of course the alveoli are arranged in groups, kind of like grapes, and a grouping is called an alveolar sac, and a whole alveolar sac is supplied with air by a duct called an alveolar duct that branches off of the bronchioles. So here's a cross section and also um, a microscopic image of what alveoli look like. So this is a bronchiole, still with some smooth muscle, so it's a little, got a thicker wall, that leads into an alveolar duct 
which is just an opening where there is epithelial tissue, basically. And all these little round structures, those are alveolar, um, alveoli arranged in sacs. So that's what it looks like. It's composed of simple squamous epithelium, which will be these nice flat cells uh, in one layer. But there are elastic fibers surrounding the epithelium to provide recoil. And I think you can see that on the previous slide the best because the alveoli beige region is the epithelium and the um, yellow strands are elastic fibers. So you can imagine this, if these alveoli expand with air during exhalation, they're going to need to deflate again. And the elastic fibers assist with that. Okay, one more cool picture of uh, the lung, and this is again from the hilum region. I wanted to show you um, how spongy this lung tissue really looks. Um, it's basically epithelium surrounded by elastic fibers, and so it really does kind of appear like a sponge. Okay, alveoli. The function is gas exchange. There's a little bit of cleansing of the air, and I'll tell you why that is. It's not because of mucus or cilia. But another thing that the alveoli do is produce this um, molecule called surfactant. Now notice that an alveoli or alveolar sac and all the alveoli are surrounded by beds of capillaries. So this is where gas is going to be able to leave the blood and enter the lung tissue or leave the space of the lung and come into the blood, both directions. So the blood supply surrounds the alveolar sacs. Let's look at the structure of the alveolar epithelium in a little bit more detail so we can explain air cleansing as well as surfactant produ um, production and what that's for. So this is a diagram of alveolar epithelium and the beige looking cells are the main simple squamous epithelium cells. Okay, We call these type 1 alveolar cells. But periodically, you'll see some green cells in there that kind of look like they make up the framework as well. These are called type 2 alveolar cells. Of course, they're not green in your body, right? But these cells, in addition to making up the wall of the alveolus, um, secrete a fluid, which acts like a detergent, really, called surfactant. And so surfactant is going to coat the inside of this alveolus. It's like a fluid. In addition, there's another cell type in your, the alveoli of your lungs, and these are macrophages. So this is the cleansing portion. Macrophages can perform phagocytosis and um, break down anything, any molecule that's been inhaled that's Maybe not. It could be toxic, toxic, or it could just be debris and, and hamper gas exchange. And notice the locations of the capillary beds. Um, they're shown in red. And so um, this is the site where gas exchange occurs between the blood and the air sacs, if you will. So we're going to look at that part of the lung now. It's called the respiratory membrane because a gas would, either direction it's going, it has to cross an alveolar cell as well as the cell of the capillary wall. So we're going to look at that in uh, a magnified view. This respiratory membrane that um, exists in the alveoli of the lungs. 
and the capillary beds surrounding them is composed of three components. The capillary endothelium cell, we call this, we call that the endothelium. It's simple squamous epithelium making up the wall of the capillary. And then there's a basement membrane, molecules like proteins and just structure. And then um, in the alveolar side is another simple squamous epithelial cell, the type 1 alveolar cell. So in order for gas to be exchanged between the blood and the air of the lung, it's going to have to cross all three of those layers, the endothelial cell, the basement membrane, and the type 1 alveolar cell. Okay, let's talk about surfactant just a little bit. Um, surfactant decreases the surface tension of the alveoli. And I know that doesn't make any sense to you yet. So what is surface tension? Surface tension is the cohesion or attraction of alveolar walls because they are coated with basically water on the inside. And water, you remember, hydrophilic, it's attracted to itself, essentially, cohesive. And so when we exhale and the alveoli deflate a little bit. We don't want these walls to be attracted to one, of one another and then collapse an alveolus. Instead, we want the alveoli, of course, to deflate somewhat, but not to the degree of collapse. And the presence of surfactant mixed in with the water reduces that surface tension so it helps prevent collapse because water is not going to be um, by itself and as attracted from wall to wall. So this shows you kind of how it works. Um, so previously I mentioned that um, surfactant is particularly important during exhalation but it's equally important during inhalation. So when we inhale, air comes into the alveolus and due to the presence of water, that, that air force would have to overcome that surface tension. You would need some force to expand that alveolus. But if instead, the water is intermixed with surfactant, these little blue molecules. Notice the alveolus is already open more from the previous exhalation. And there's a reduction in surface tension. The force inward is decreased. And so the air doesn't have to overcome so much surface tension. Um, to expand that alveoli even further. So surfactant's really important, and we'll talk about that when we do disorders of the respiratory system again. So thank you very much for the listening.